guys, if we could, please. <laughs> Good energy in the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, as we start every meeting, we're going to start with Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right. We are going to start this evening. We have quite a few uh, recognitions, which is always fun and exciting to uh, wrap up the school year. We're going to actually start uh, with Ms. Seidel, the um, principal of Simsbury High School, who is going to introduce a couple students that were involved with the yearbook and uh, those board members that ordered a yearbook. will get their yearbook. Great. So I'd like to um, introduce you to our yearbook editors this year, Paige Mahoney and Ella Senaviva. Can you try to repeat that? Okay. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the two of them who have put together our yearbook for the year. Um, if you don't mind taking a moment, I'm going to pass the mic over to you to tell us a little bit about the theme for this year and anything that was interesting along the way in the process as you put this together for your class and for all of us. Because it's a special moment not only for the students, but also for all of the staff um, to take a look and see the pictures and really collect the memories of all the things that happened along the way. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, we're really, really proud of this year's yearbook. Um, our theme is Out of This World. Uh, we kind of wanted to represent the idea of like starting a new chapter of life, kind of uncharted territory similar to space. Um, Paige and I worked really, really hard. Uh, yearbook is only an extracurricular activity and we have limited staff, so everyone who worked on it like really, really gave it their all. Um, we put in a lot of time and we're really happy with how it came out. I just wanna add, um, it was really, we weren't able to do this without our staff, um, especially considering we didn't have a whole lot of underclassmen, so the juniors who really stepped up and took on a lot of the spreads and a lot of that work, um, and we're really excited to see what they do with the book next year, because they're very, very talented. I just wanted to add a thank you too to our advisors. It's Lena Askazubi and Sarah Avril who assist the students in um, working with them after school and do an amazing job. And it's just really great to see if you're not familiar with the process on the day of senior breakfast, um, all of our seniors come in, the SPTC puts together an amazing spread for them and they get to pick up their yearbook and have an opportunity to share that first glance with each other as a school community and as a class. So it was a really great opportunity for me to see that the first time this year of them getting to see it, crack it open, and really start that process of um, writing to each other and just capturing some of those last moments of their senior year together. So congratulations to both of you on a lot of hard work, and thank you. So, and if there's anybody, yeah, the past, the, the we can thank let you very much. board members take a look. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, I have the next one. I am going to embarrass Darla Strand. Ms. Darla Strand, if you could stand up for a moment. Um, Ms. Strand is our Chamber of Commerce Educator of the Year. Yeah. Third grade teacher extraordinaire over at Squadron Line School. Um, Squadron Line certainly a special place in, in my heart where my career started uh, in Simsbury and, squat, and uh, Darla was one of those go-to staff members for me when I was a, a principal uh, at Squadron Line School. And I know Darla, you can't stand the attention, so I'll be quick <laughs> with this. But Darla had an opportunity to, to do a nice evening uh, event that the chamber puts on where they uh, celebrate both an educator of the year and a business person of the year. Uh, and we couldn't have a more fitting uh, person to put forward this year. And when we talk about education excellence, um, I think Darla is the perfect example of holding kids to high standards mm -hmm. in creating a wonderful environment and evidence that you can do both. And you don't have to give, a one wet, give away one 
to build the other. And I guess that is how I would really talk about it. She's always pushing herself to make connections with students and find that pathway uh, into unlocking their learning. Uh, always a problem solver, not a problem identifier. Uh, and, and that's always much appreciated in terms of somebody that wants to be part of uh, creating solutions and, and making our district a better place. So I am so proud as your former principal and now superintendent to have you here tonight. I know you're going out for a nice dinner, but just wanted to. Yes, yeah, yeah. You made it. I just want to say. Recognizing Isla and Maylin, oh my goodness, and <laughs> Diane and Sue, I've had Neil's daughter my first first or second year. Um, it's an honor to work with so many amazing people and the most amazing kids. So. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. All right, next up on the docket, we have the McGowan Scholarship Award winner. Oh, so we're so excited. I see a couple. I don't know if I missed a couple, but um, as the board knows, Miss Kathleen McGowan, who is an educator here in Simsbury for 35 years, left a very generous donation, which the board has in turn um, done a couple of things with. One is supporting innovative teaching grants each year, but the second is to establish five scholarships one for a student from each elementary school, a graduating senior who is going into education or a related field. So at the award ceremony last week, we honored the following students, and I think three out of the five are here. So from Central School, Charlie, I saw you, Charlie Steniger. Char yeah. Charlie is going to be attending Leslie University. So great, Charlie, very happy for you. Is Parker here? Yeah. Parker, great, Parker, <laughs> if you could stand up. Parker Golden Gerald uh, is our guest. <laughs> From Latimer Lane, and Parker, you're attending CCSU yep. in the fall? Fantastic. And our third student who is here from Terrafield School, Ruby Scudder. <laughs> also attending CCSU. And our two students who are not here but were recognized from Squadron Line School was Rachel Coda. She's attending Penn State University <coughs> next year. And from Tooten Hill School, Ashwina Yoganadian, who's attending UConn. So want to congratulate those students, again, who will be pursuing education or a related field and continuing the legacy of Ms. McGowan. Fantastic. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, next on the docket, we kind of started this tradition of inviting state championship teams <laughs> to the board, knowing it hardly ever happens. <laughs> and this year, it has been an amazing run uh, for athletics at Simsbury High School. So we have two teams here tonight, which we're very excited about. We have the girls' rugby team and the men's volleyball team, which is great. So I'm going to kick this to you, Mr. Penny, to give us a little uh, overview of their success and celebration. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Um, we had several teams that were a game or two just shy yes. as well. So mm -hmm. have to mention boys ice hockey, boys across, girls across, who were right there with, with coming to meetings. So it's nice to see everybody again. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great year. Um, thank you for the support. Thank you to the parents. Thank you to the coaches. Thank you to the student athletes for your efforts along the way. Um, there's been so much going on. I actually have notes, which is rare <laughs> for me. Um, uh, I'll talk in the order that they won their championships, because that's fair. So girls rugby won theirs first, and theirs is really a story of what are we going to do next. Um, it's a team that won state titles two of the last four years prior to this year, but we had a really tough end of the season last year. We didn't know if we were going to have a team. We, we had a lot of students graduate. We didn't have the numbers. We had to make some adjustments. We had to go out and find a new coach. So Mr. Ryan Bond was our new coach that we hired for this year. Nice job raising the bar. We love it. Um, so Ryan came in with the right personality, the right passion, the right fit for our girls, and really helped drive the team forward. They did an amazing job. They went 11 and one. They had the highest uh, ratio, the highest margin of victory of any team in the league. Um, and to the point where actually their opening round playoff game, the team forfeited because they didn't want to play them. So that's the level that they got to and that they started at. It was very impressive. It was very fun to be a part of and very fun to watch. 
and so proud of the girls. Um, Want to recognize Captain Peyton Wagner, uh, Sarah Medica, who Coach said were certainly leaders in the team, do all the right things. Really, the passion of the girls is what carried this program forward. Like I said, we didn't know if we were going to have a team. And for us to go from we might not have a team to we're state champions is just an amazing turnaround. And that's a credit to Coach coming in, but it's certainly a credit to our families who advocated and said we want to make sure that we have a season and to our players most of all for following through the dedication and the passion for the sport. Congratulations. We couldn't be more proud of you. The last plug for them, if you did not get a chance to see it, they did get a national shout out on ESPN, yes. which was very impressive, very cool. Um, that doesn't happen to all of our state champions, so please, that's not the bar. Um, we do the best we can, but it was a really a cool thing to watch. It was a really amazing opportunity for you to get recognized for coach. Uh, it was something just, it's definitely going to be a career highlight for me of something that when you make the national broadcast of Sports Center, that's pretty impressive. And, and you did that. So we're super proud of you for being able to do that. Uh, next is our 23-0 and boys volleyball team. They won the division, they won the conference championship, and then they went on to win the state championship in dominating fashion. 3-0 um, in the championship. They dropped five sets all season in 23 games. That is unbelievable in the world of volleyball. That is unbelievably impressive. Walking into tryouts day one, I know Coach felt it. I know I felt it. I know we talked about it. This is a special group of players. We knew what you could do. We couldn't be more proud that you were able to go out and do it. There's a lot of pressure there. There's a lot of expectation. But you did what we wanted you to do, what we expected of you, and what we hoped that we had laid the foundation of for you. And you did the work. And we are thrilled to be able to recognize you. Um, that's our first ever undefeated season in boys volleyball. They are back-to-back -back CCC champions. They won the, the conference last year as well. They won the CIAC Invitational at the beginning of the season. They won the River Valley Cup again this year. They pretty much dominated anything that we threw at them, um, including a team that had won how many straight games? 75 straight games they beat early in the season to knock them off their pedestal. And arguably, even though we were Class M, I would say because we beat that team, the best team in volleyball okay. in the state. Is it Darien? Yeah. It was Darien. Darien. Mm -hmm. 75 straight games they won. We knocked them off. So now you beat up on my alma mater in the final, too. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> um, I was rooting for the right side. <laughs> a, a couple of interesting awesome. stats Coach shared with me. Uh, Aiden Cohen had 62 blocks. Aiden Ouellette had 213 digs. Anderson Pillar went 344 out of 352 serves, 98%. It's the equivalent of foul shooting in basketball, 98%. Yeah, unbelievable. Adam Vincent with 335 kills and Jason George with 690 assists. That is impressive. You are an impressive group of athletes, an impressive group of human beings. I'd say my favorite moment of that championship game was when the official, the up judge, made the wrong call. He actually gave us a point. Our kids in the middle of a championship match went over with the ball, politely, respectfully, corrected him, and gave the point to the other team because they wanted to win the right way. So, hard to do in the moment, nothing but respect for the fact that you did it. It's been great to have this group of seniors lead us through these championships. It's been an amazing year. Thank you, everybody, for your support. We look forward to, if we're underclassmen, trying to top this next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Coach O'Blank, I just want to say this. As somebody that came in when both this, the sport of volleyball on both sides, right, the, the girls program and the men's program hadn't had a lot of success. And for one coach to build these programs up with the support of the wonderful kids and families, you've done a, you've done a wonderful job as well. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Yes. Would you like to do a photo? I would. Yeah. Let's do girls rugby first. They brought they brought their cup and their black. So Jeff, you gotta get in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> over here. We're gonna go over here. Yep. Right. Okay. We're out there. How about we line up over here? Get some good real estate. Okay. Right. Those 
Strand had one of the Tyndall Let's boys too, just just for the record. Darla, thank you. <laughs> Have a fun night. Thanks for everything. Bye, Darla. Enjoy your dinner. Bye, Gary. Yeah. 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 Um, she really has. Yeah. Exactly. That. Okay, so next up, uh, public audience. Uh, okay. Diana Yisley, <laughs> 78 County Road, Simsbury. I'm actually here just uh, to just tell you on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, first of all, congratulations to the graduating class of 2024. Thank you. Um, what, what a wonderful ceremony it was on Friday night. But I also wanted to let you all know that uh, the Board of Selectmen have recognized June as Pride Month. Um, and we know that that uh, is something that affects everybody in our community. And we've also recognized Alzheimer's Awareness Month for the month of June. Um, so I just wanted to point those two things out for the Board of Ed, uh, since it's something that affects a lot of families and uh, everyone in our community. So we did recognize those uh, in June um, as, as Pride Month and Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Thanks, Thank Daniel. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, committee reports. Uh, I guess we'll go with this. Uh, Sharon? This way. Um, I don't have anything. Okay. Brian? Nope. Just, uh, it was great to be at graduation Friday mm -hmm. night. Um, sure. Sharon was there, and Jessica and Jeff, and obviously the rest of you. So, um, we got weather held rain, off. Right. We, got, we, we held on a little bit. We got a little wet, but otherwise, <laughs> it was a great night. And thank you um, also for letting me give my diploma to my daughter. That was special. So, um, yeah, it was a wonderful night. Jeff? Updates for me, Jess. Just uh, that was my first graduation mm. ceremony I attended. It was beautiful. The mm -hmm. speeches were amazing, mm -hmm. and it was great to be a part of it. And congratulations to the class of 2024. That's all I have to say okay. for now. <laughs> <laughs> Katie. Okay. Amy. All set. Thanks. Neil. All set. Sue. Just finishing up the school year. Yeah. Lots of celebrations. Sixth grade promotions. Eighth yeah. grade promotions. So. Just a lot of celebrations for Great. wonderful hard work on behalf of our students and staff. Great. Great. Thanks. And, and just let me echo the others. Um, the graduation was a special, special day. 
Uh, obviously, I had a son who went through it, and like Brian said, to be able to give my son his diploma I, is just a moment I will never forget. And uh, I, do, I should get points for keeping it together. I will, uh, uh, um, even just talking about it makes me a little emotional, to be honest with you. But so it's just a, a wonderful night, wonderful ceremony. Um, congratulations to the class of 2024. I've, I've known a lot of them since they were little ones. So just to see them at this moment is, is pretty special. And let me just plug one more thing. The, uh, the, night, the night before, two nights before, I had the honor of going to the retiree dinner, um, which was a really, just a, a, a really wonderful dinner. If you need affirmation about the teacher's commitment to these students, <clears throat> that there's nothing more that'll give it to you. I just to spend a few minutes with some of these teachers who were retiring was really, really heartwarming and, and just actually boosted, gave me a lot of energy to keep going and, and tackle these some of these bigger issues that we're tackling. Um, just great night. So with that, let me stop there. Jeff, could I add one other thing Please. about that? The, um, sorry, I also want to recognize um, after graduation, there was a phenomenal party here at the high school for the seniors. Um, from 10 to like 2.30 in the morning, believe it or not. Um, that's when my daughter got home. It was uh, a safe environment. It was well run. Yeah. Uh, SP, uh, PC, PC yeah. ran it. Um, you know, they had bounce houses. They had cornhole. They had musical chairs. They had a ton of fun events for the kids. And I want to say 8, 75, 80% of the kids went, um, which is phenomenal from what I've heard yeah. in the past years. So kudos to the SPPC mm -hmm. and whoever else was involved in that event because it was well attended and well received. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curtis. I would just say one of the most exciting parts about being an educator and it's a challenge too, but it's that cycle we go through on an annual basis. So to be able to celebrate these year end uh, moments and be able to reflect on the things, uh, you know, some of the challenges and some of the things that went well during the year is always uh, an important piece. I wanted to take a minute and just thank the board members. Uh, this is our last, unless we hold a special meeting, which we often do sometimes during the summer, but our last uh, scheduled meeting of the year. And uh, you put in a lot of time, a lot of a lot of valuable input and feedback. So I thank you for, for that and your support. Certainly we can't do the work without you. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm all set. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on. The uh, first item, the action item is the approval of the May 21st uh, workshop. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes thank of the May. Oh. Is there a second? Second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Uh, moving on to the approval of the May 28th meeting minutes. Um, move for the approval Great. of the May 28th Great. meeting minutes. Is there a second? We'll second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Moving on to personnel. Neil? Yeah, we have a number of items tonight, including, uh, as I told you I think during one of the workshops we always have a few people who um, will retire at the end of a school year but they wait till just the last second <laughs> to um, let us know they're the people who just don't want a whole lot of fanfare usually but they deserve a little bit tonight so I'll say a few words about each of them as uh, I, I uh, ask you to then make the motion the first one is Maureen Billings 25 years in Simsbury Second grade at Squadron Line. Uh, this is like the walk down memory lane for me tonight to have Darla Strand here, who taught my daughter, and Maureen Billings, who taught my son. Um, and Maureen has been in second grade like forever. forever. It's been mm -hmm. second grade the whole time I've known her, um, and one of the rocks of Squadron Line. So congratulations to Maureen. Peter Evans is a history teacher here at Simsbury High School, um, 21 years in the district. Um, and Peter, most recently over the past 10 to 12 years, has been one of the teachers of AP US History, one of the most demanding courses that we have in our uh, department and in our curriculum. And um, Peter has been a centerpiece of that. Um, and uh, that he entered education after about 20 years of a law career. So he was a mid-career change and um, it's now time to not have a career. So congratulations 
um, to Peter and his retirement. And then 30 years in Simsbury for Audrey Leisure. Um, Audrey is a part of our music department at Central School with a um, real talent. Audrey um, is the only teacher in the district who teaches lessons both all the strings at Central and all the instruments at Central. So um, just a diverse and talented um, teacher. And so there's a combined 76 years of service to Simsbury for you, and all of them will be retiring um, at the end of the month. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I say that because one of my sons had uh, Ms. Billings. So mm. uh, can I get a motion, please? I'll move that the Board of Ed accept the retirements of Maureen Billings, Peter Evans, and Audrey Leisure, effective June 30, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Right. Any discussion? I just want to say my Matt had Miss Billings, mm. so she's phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both my kids had Mr. Evans, so my older yeah. kids had Mr. Evans, so he's wonderful too. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you again, and with our sincerest gratitude for the 76 years communal. <laughs> uh, and the, these other folks are uh, people who are going to uh, who are announcing their retirement for the future. It's a stipulation in their contract that if they um, announce uh, to help us plan succession plan, essentially that there um, is a small stipend that they receive, so um, they can give us three years' notice. So three of the teachers are doing that. That would be uh, Marie-Lynn Bruhl, who is a French teacher at Henry James, Marie Chicotti, who is a um, sixth grade teacher at Latimer Lane, and Dawn Medvey, who has been an English teacher at uh, Henry James, I should say will continue to be for the next three years, an English teacher um, at Henry James. In addition, we have a person giving one year's notice who will retire next June 30th, and that is uh, our science teacher here uh, at Simsbury High School, Denise Temporelli. So we congratulate all four of them, but we get to hold on to them for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And the motion is there for your consideration. Okay, can I get a motion, please? Move that the Board of Education accept the notices of intent to retire uh, Marie Lynn Grohl, uh, Marie Chikoski, uh, and Don Medby, effective June 30th, 2027. And of Denise Temporal temporarily effective June 30th, 2025. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Just want to take a second. Of the seven teachers here, the shortest tenure, shortest, is 20 years. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's phenomenal, and I wanted to point that out. I think that speaks volumes to the to the environment and the quality of the of the system. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much to all seven. Uh, moving on, uh, I guess this is me. Uh, the approval of the superintendent's contract. Uh, as we do every year, we, we review uh, the superintendent's uh, contract and how the year went and uh, set up goals for the following year. Uh, we went through the usual process met several times and um, you know, uh, came to the conclusion uh, of the motion that's that's before us. There's not a ton else I can say, quite frankly. Um, so there is a, a motion before you uh, for somebody, please. I'll make it. Okay. Move that the Board of Education approve the superintendent's contract for 2024-2027 with a salary increase of 2.9% for 2024 to 2025. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I echo what you said. Um, I think we're very, very fortunate to have Matt. Um, we're lucky to have him stay with us and he communicates effectively with us and with everyone and on his staff. I think we're very, very fortunate. Um, and Lydia passed on her. Yeah. Thank you. I just meant to say that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, let me just echo what Brian just said. We have, a, I, I believe, a tremendous leader uh, in the school system, puts forward a great team, puts forward a great product, uh, and that is really to your leadership. And I, we, I, and I know I speak for the board, greatly appreci appreciate all your efforts and your team's effort. Um, so I'm happy to put forward this motion. So any other discussion? Great. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to our continued work. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, approval of the policy revisions. So these are here for mm -hmm. final approval after we've placed them on the agendas of the last two meetings. Um, they come in three sort of sets, one of small bylaw revisions, um, some policy revisions driven by legislation, and then the 2000 series, the administration series, which is mostly about the roles and responsibilities of the superintendent. Um, at last year's meeting when we passed policy, there was a request to do each of the policies individually. Um, we'll do the 2000 set as a whole, but otherwise to vote on each policy. So we're going to have a little bit of a motion fest here, right now. <laughs> uh, I don't mind doing them. I don't usually speak up, so I'll, <laughs> I'll rock them all out. Move to adopt the revised bylaw 304 standing committees effective June 11th, 2024. Um, I, didn't, no, I, I, think take I think the request yeah. was to vote on each one. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I need a second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Move to adopt the revised bylaw 412 participation meetings by telephone effective June 11th, 2024. Great. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I have discussion. So discussion is if we at any time we can bring can we can bring any of these back, right? Sure. Even though we just vote, right? You can bring any of them back. All right, okay, because there's some has to be changed. Okay. I mean it has to go through the policy. Right, it'll go committee. through the policy committee yeah. as a chair, but yeah. Okay. That's it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Move to adopt the revised policy 4210 Minority Teacher Recruitment effective June 11th, 2024. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Move to adopt the revised policy 5112.1 Age of Entering Kindergarten effective June 11th, 2024. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Move to adopt the revised policy 5113, required attendance effective June 11th, 2024. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Move to adopt the revised policy 5146.3, suicide prevention and intervention effective June 11th, 2024. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Move to adopt the revised policy 6116, diplomas and certificates effective June 11th, 2024. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Last. Move to adopt the revised policy series 2000, administration effective June 11th, 2024. Okay. Second. Didn't get right. okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, end of the year fiscal authorization, authorizations. Yeah, that one's me. Um, so this is something that we do at the end of every fiscal year. Um, since the board doesn't typically meet in the summer, summer months, um, <coughs> we give authorization to the superintendent um, to authorize certain acts on behalf of the board. So the first one is federal and state grants. Um, you're giving him the authorization to renew our applications, which are due each summer. So our IDEA um, grants, our title grants, things of that nature, giving him permission to move forward and renew those applications so we can get the money for fiscal year 25. <coughs> the transfer of funds. Um, this is something that we do every year as part of our audit. We true up our accounts. So say um, office supplies is over budget and instructional supplies is under budget. We are going to move our, the money in between those two lines to zero them out so everything is within budget. That's something that we do as part of the audit. We do not change the budget in any way. We are just moving the money in and out so everything zeroes at the end. And then the last one um, is you're giving the ability um, to the superintendent to hire teachers during the summer months of July and August, um, or you are not um, meeting there during those months. Great. Any questions? Okay. Oh, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, anybody, uh, can somebody make the motion? 
Um, first, I move that the Simsbury Board of Education authorizes the superintendent to act as the board's agent in renewing applications for state and federally funded programs. A second. Are we doing these individually too? Or? Yeah. Okay. Can I do them? Yeah, you can. Oh, so second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Move that the Simsbury Board of Education authorizes the superintendent to transfer funds from those accounts in which a surplus is anticipated into those accounts in which a deficit is anticipated. Great. Second. Second. Great. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Move that the superintendent, with the approval of the board chairman, be authorized to hire staff for the 2024-2025 school year during the period of July and August when the board is not in session. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Uh, the summer meeting schedule. It's, that one's you, bud. Is it me? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> um, well, Matt kind of Matt said this right. And typically, uh, we do not meet during the summer months. Um, so that's the need for uh, you know we canceling officially canceling these obviously there'll be work going on over the months and and i would anticipate somehow gathering at some point but um this is traditionally what we do uh with with uh canceling the summer meetings any questions great um now that, just a quick question yeah. now that we have the revised policy where we can do meetings electronically mm -hmm. Does it make sense to keep one or two of them on the books, or we just be calling special meetings? So uh, yeah, I think that's probably a better way to approach. I'm not against it at all, and I, and I quite frankly, especially with all the conversation we've had at the workshop, I would anticipate one along mm -hmm. the way. Um, but let's let's just get past the school year, yeah. and then we can <laughs> go back to that, see where we're at. So, okay. okay. I'll make a motion. Okay. Move that the Board of Education cancel regular board meetings scheduled on June 24th, July 9th, July 23rd, August 13th, and August 27th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I have discussion. I kind of agree that it would be good to keep them on the board, but um, rather than having to create a special meeting, I think based on our goal setting meeting, I think there's an opportunity for us to get together. Um, during the summer this year, um, different than in the past years. Um, so that's just my comment. Any other any other comments? Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Great. Uh, acceptance of the gift to FIRST Robotics. I love being able to tee mm. these up. Uh, tonight the gift is specifically to the SHS FIRST Robotics Club that we have here. The gift <clears throat> is for $5,000 from Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense Company. And these funds are to be used to offset some of the costs that were uh, incurred for the team's trip to Houston, as well as supplies needed to participate in that competition. So there is a motion there for your consideration. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so can I get a motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I move that the proposed gift to the first robotics team at Simsbury High School from the EB Aerospace and Defense Company totaling $5,000 be approved. Second. Great. Awesome. Any discussion? They just keep stepping up. Yeah, over. absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I, I was thinking the same exact thing. They're a customer of mine mm -hmm. in the IT world, and they um, they just keep coming through for us. It's great. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable well, partnership. Just, uh, yeah. Unbelievable community partnership. We greatly appreciate this. Uh, any anything else? Great. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, thank you. Motion passes. Uh, wait, I lost my spot. <laughs> um, approval of the educator evaluation plan. Sure, that's back to me. So in April, Neil and I were able to present to you some changes that had happened legislatively regarding evaluator, uh, educator evaluation in the state. And it really returned a lot of the decision-making power back to districts, specifically to districts PDEC, which is Professional Development Evaluation Committee. 
So we had a very robust group of about 20 educators meeting monthly since this legislation was changed to really look at our current practices around educator evaluation and what we wanted this plan to be relative to the guidelines set forth by the state. So I, uh, Neil and I have created a one-page document, which is in your packets, but you also received um, for the preparation materials, which is just kind of a high leverage look at what are the design changes of this plan. Uh, you were also given a, a copy of the drafted plan. And I really want to thank certainly Neil our co-chair of the PDEC committee, Kara Massler, who is a first grade teacher at Squadron Line School, and all of the PDEC members who are um, named on this plan. They really worked hard to take what we believe should be about the spirit of continuous improvement. How do we get better as educators for kids so that our teaching and learning is just leveled up one extra notch. And we believe that this plan really reflects all of those components. So as we had shared with you in April, legislatively, we are required to submit our new plan to the state. But prior to doing so, we need Board of Ed approval. So there is a motion there for your consideration this evening. Can I just ask before we ask a quick question? I apologize if you've already addressed this. So you submit it to the state. Mm -hmm. Do are we just submitting it, or do we have to get like approval? So technically, they approve it. Okay. We don't know what that approval process is yet. <laughs> they haven't said who the kind of overseer of that uh -huh. approval process will be, uh, but they have sent each district kind of a link to upload the plan. Okay. Um, I believe if the the plan meets all of the guidelines set forth mm -hmm. by the state, then it will be approved, mm -hmm. and we yeah. could say confidently that we believe this plan hits those oh, I'm marks. Sure. I'm just, I was just curious. Yeah. Great, before you is a motion, can I get something to so I, Can I ask a question? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So the only reference, I mean, I, I'll look through the other, I don't think I saw any other questions, but this is, it references a platform, what platform since 2012? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we have a kind of a data platform that we've created in-house and it's called SIMS, our Simsbury Information Management System. And so that's our place where we uh, put all kinds of student data that we can look at and uh, play around with and make use to make informed decisions. But we also have a whole component relative to teacher evaluation, uh, forms and requirements and who needs how many observations and who does those observations. So one of the benefits of having this platform created ahead of time, Sharon, was that we work directly with the developer. And so as we want to make changes, they can make those in ready time versus using a product that's already out there that we can't necessarily personalize. But we'll continue with this platform making these changes. Dave is actually working very close with our developer as these changes have been coming up. So we're really excited to continue that use. That's great. Okay. And then I saw that for the feedback you guys are using um, SMART, so specific, measurable, um, attainable, realistic, SMART and goals. timely goals, yes. SMART goals, okay. yes. Can you also just elaborate on the differences between the type and number of observations for tenured and non-tenured? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, for non-tenured teachers, certainly if they're newer to Simsbury or newer to the profession, then we're going to want to do deeper dives into practice, more formal observations. A formal observation starts with a pre-observation where teacher and evaluator will sit down and talk about the goals of the lesson, what that's going to look like. Um, actual an observation where the evaluator will go in and observe that classroom practice and then kind of a post conference with with feedback so very detailed very um, lots of time goes into those because we want to make sure that our educators are certainly aware of the expectations that we have of them through our differentiated teaching standards um, once we have that practice for a while uh, we understand that tenured teachers, uh, we might be looking at different kinds of practice that may not require as deep of a dive, but are still important to go in and observe and get feedback. 
you know, we are a district that works off continuous improvement and how do we get better at what we do for students. So that is kind of the difference uh, of that. We also might do something called a review of practice. So we might take a look at, um, for our teacher leaders, a review of a meeting that they're running or participation in a very big school event. Um, because we know that so many things make up really great practice and certainly that starts in the classroom but can be outside of the classroom walls as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Rubrics? So read the motion? Sure. Move that the board accept the Simsbury Educator Evaluation Plan as presented by the administration. Great. Mr. Second. Second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. You're welcome. Right. On to information and reports. Mr. Prince, Dave, Frank. Right? yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tee that one up for us, too? Or? Sure. So right. it has been such a uh, personal and professional pleasure to cool. work with Dave. Uh, he is in his first <laughs> ending, his first complete year as the Director of Instructional Technology, uh, comes to us with uh, experience as a well-seasoned administrator um, here in Connecticut, both in New York, and has this wonderful skill set around instructional technology. So we certainly knew we, that we had some big shoes to fill as Maggie transitioned to the principal <coughs> role and Dave came into this role. And certainly with that, there are new things on the horizon. Let's talk about AI a little bit. Let's <laughs> talk about how we're going to be rebranding our district and how do we make our vision of a graduate really come alive. So tonight Dave's going to talk about some of that big picture work, um, but also some of the nitty gritty work. So Dave works very closely with our library media specialists and he also works with our technicians, right, who are going around and problem solving and um, that's been a, a great deal of what Dave's done this first year. And it's, like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure. So he's gonna highlight some of his work of the year, um, some of the challenges that are facing instructional technology and give you a little view into the future and what that looks Excellent. like here in Simsbury. So Dave Princey. Great introduction, well, thank you. And thank you guys for having me. Um, Sue, so I didn't think of this when I put myself here. Would you mind? I would love to, Thank Anna. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> It was not intentional. Um, as I mentioned, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's, I think, great to recap the last um, 10 months of not only my work, but my team's work also. Um, and I, I, for me, at least, uh, personally and professionally, it's a great way to close out uh, my first school year within this district, and I, it's been a great year. So with that, um, in starting the year, uh, just a, a little background on the way that we view instructional technology. It's not necessarily a thing that exists in a vacuum, but we really want it to be sort of the lifeblood of every other department within the school system. Um, when you start thinking about technology, instructional technology specifically as a standalone in any way, that's when you start getting yourself into trouble. So we really like to think of ourselves and the work that we do um, as you know, comprehensively impacting what students are doing in classrooms, what teachers are doing to prepare for those students in classrooms, but really everything that we're doing is thinking about um, sort of the, the impact on the end user. In this case, it's um, it's our students. So with all that being said, just as a, a, a definition for sort of how we look at the work, four streams that we really wanted to dig into this year, um, considering where we are as a district and as a department, um, was the first one was the, the management of data in all, in all forms. Um, you know, performance data, um, student data, hard data, observational data, and the way that that's living and becoming accessible for our, our teachers to serve our kids. Obviously, the, the second stream, a, a big hot button issue, not only within education, but in every sector of life, it seems at this point, is artificial intelligence, very specifically um, the impact that it's having on teaching and learning. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, marketing for the district, and by marketing, I, I do mean the way that we're connecting with our community, with the public, and, and the, the message that we're sending out there to celebrate the things that our kids and our teachers are doing in classrooms, on athletic fields, on stages. Just it's a remarkable body of work. How do we get that out there and engage our community so that they can, you know, feel invested and be as proud of these kids as we are? 
And then finally, the last stream was um, to sort of tie all of the instructional technology work together and really connect to that the, the classroom experience for kids with um, propelling the work of a vision of a graduate, specifically trying to figure out how to make sure that it's not just living at the high school, even though, you know, when we talk about the end vision of the graduate, it's obviously a 12th grader. We saw a whole bunch of kids who had realized that vision walk across the stage um, on Friday night. But to get to that point, we really think it's important to connect that vision from kindergarten through 12th grade. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that also. Um, anything that, that I'm gonna sort of walk you guys through tonight, I, I wanna make sure I, I say this, um, nothing is finished. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of things that were very much in progress. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the plan for the, not only the next school year, but the coming school years also. Thanks. Um, so following the, the recommendation of the State Board of Education, we developed um, a district-wide AI task force. I'm gonna actually um, pass around a couple of artifacts for this one. These are linked to the exhibit, but I wanted to make sure that you guys had paper copies um, to not only follow along with what I'm saying, but so that you know, when you have a couple of minutes, you can take a look at it because the two documents together really do give us a picture of where this team is going. This is not a, a one year and done sitting committee, um, but this is something that we wanna make sure that we can mobilize when we need it to, that it becomes a one of the many committees that's a fabric of this school district because I think as we all know from our own lives, um, artificial intelligence is ever changing, it's ever present. There are so many different iterations out there and we really wanna make sure that we've got our smartest, most engaged people working collaboratively to think about the implications that that has for our students. So the first thing I'm gonna um, pass around is the goals for the team. Um, these, were, these were set at the beginning of the year. They're, they're meant to be um, two-year goals. So we'll get to the end of next school year, we'll take stock of where we are, just like we are you know, at this point of the year, and then we'll figure out um, you know, what the next two and three years hold for that. The second artifact that I'm passing out, and I'll explain a little bit more about this when we get there, is our outcome from this year's work. Um, it is a little bit longer of a document, so you know, do not feel compelled to read this um, sort of on the spot, but take it home with you. Um, this is the direction that we're going. The second artifact called knowledge and skills recommendations, this is gonna be the document that um, influences a lot of our work, especially next year, in terms of um, development for teachers and also the work for students at two very different levels of school, elementary and secondary, because we, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but we are starting to see that the impl implications for kids in classrooms are different for you know a student who's in kindergarten through sixth grade versus a, a student who may be in you know, seventh grade through 12th grade. So that's the second document coming around now. Um, so obviously the, the goal of this committee, um, I mentioned a, a recommendation came out um, as ironically as a policy from the State Department of Education, but that policy was really a recommendation. Um, form a team, do some research, start learning, don't do anything else yet. So we really, we really took that to heart um, with the idea that we can, we can make all these decisions right now, but as soon as you know, we make a decision a week later, a month later, the landscape is gonna be changed and you're gonna have to remake the decision again. So really the purpose of this committee, uh, this task force for this school year was to really dig in as much as possible and talk about the different levels of tools, their purposes, um, and really how to best equip our teachers to harness that power for our students. So um, the slide mentions the outcome being an inventory of the knowledge and skills. That's the second document that, that you have there. Um, we made the decision to gear this document um, and it wasn't, it wasn't our notion at the start of this process, but once we sort of dug into it, we really um, started to flesh out that we've got three different groups of stakeholders here. We've got the kids who are gonna be using this in the classroom. So how does, how does this apply to them and their work and their eventual success, especially as it applies to the vision of the graduate? We have the teachers who are the gatekeepers for all of this knowledge. So how do we develop their skills? How do we make them aware of some of these different um, applications and implications? And then the third group, which I, I don't know that a lot of other districts are, are giving this equal weight. For this to work for our school district, um, our parents, our families, our community has to be as aware almost 
as teachers do in terms of our game plan for this um, through transparent communication. The fact that we are not putting anything in front of our anything in front of our students that's going to encourage dishonesty, that's going to encourage plagiarism, um, but that we really are making a concerted effort to teach these skills and these tools in the right way, um, because we see it as a coming skill for students. That's going to differentiate them from other students, not only in you know middle and high school, but when they leave schools, when they when they go to college, when they enter the workforce. If we're not harnessing this power, if we're not giving them these skills, we're putting our kids at a disadvantage. So first step is to really look at those three groups as stakeholders, and then the inventory that you, um, the stapled copy, those are sort of the knowledge and skills that this really, um, this really great committee came up with as an outcome for the rest of the year. Um, I, I should mention, um, it's on the slide, but the, when we talk about a comprehensive committee, especially considering the distinction that we came up with that the, this work is going to be different in elementary school than it might be at the secondary level. Um, I, I can let you as a board know that we had um, representatives on this, this monthly committee from all three school levels, elementary, middle, and high, and all seven school buildings. So I really feel like we had a, um, an accurate cross-section of um, sort of the different viewpoints throughout the district. Thanks, Sid. Um, one of our other streams that became really important um, this year, and it will continue for the next couple of years, is how can we connect with our community? How can we, how can we get out um, in a clear, concise, engaging way these great things that are happening all throughout our seven schools and, and throughout the district? Um, dovetailing with that was also this opportunity to demystify the vision of a graduate. It's, it, the work has been afoot for the last couple of years at the very least. How can we use this opportunity to, to send this really clear message and to also talk about this incredible work of preparation that our teachers are doing with our kids and the incredible work that the, the kids are doing as a result of that. So sort of two objectives. Um, we're thinking about the way, we're, and we're still thinking about it, but the outcome was a cre the creation of a video series. We got two four-ish four minute videos out. They really are um, you know, true to life of, of the experience of kids and teachers in classrooms. The first video was just an overview of, you know, for our community, what the vision of a graduate is and what it really means for students. You know, when, they, when they leave 12th grade, how is this really setting them up for success in life beyond high school? And then the second video, um, I'm smiling because it was the communication subcommittee who really pushed us to feature kids prominently. There are no adults um, speaking in the second video, and we really feel like we're telling a, a great story about one specific um, VOG indicator, which is critical thinking, and very specifically, it's problem solving. Now, I have to say that, um, you know, it's not. One of our clubs doesn't make the world championships every month, so we were able to sort of parlay. We were able to sort of parlay that success and then sort of reverse engineer the story. Um, if you haven't seen the video yet, it's up on the website. Uh, Mr. Curtis sent it out, um, and it's also on our uh, district's YouTube channel. But it really, I hope, sets a really clear through line um, using a whole bunch of fourth graders and what they're doing with our STEM education. Um, and then juxtaposing that to our 12th grade first robotics captain who just got back from Houston and the, the uh, robotics world championships. And they're talking about the same thing. And what they're talking about is this like really specific version of problem solving that involves high pressure, that involves really deep thinking, that involves sort of this attention to detail. Um, and the whole theme of the video, um, which again makes me smile, is that these skills don't happen by accident, and they happen with this plan from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and you can see it, I, I think, really clearly through that video. So again, just getting started here, we're, um, we're always thinking about ways to engage our community. Um, videos are going to get to some people. They're not going to get to everybody. So we're, all, we're constantly trying to think of what, what are those other ways that we can expand our reach just so we can communicate these great things that are happening with our broader community. Can I just ask you, and on those videos, are you tracking like views and all of that yeah. just to make sure? That's that's it, why I'm so keen on um, <laughs> getting alternate, in addition to the videos, yeah. getting different ways to that's, engage with that, people that's also. That's where I was heading, yeah. Yep. Great, thanks. It's a great point. Um, Sue mentioned the the work with library media specialists. You know, at this, at this point, um, 
in our in our culture, it would be impossible to say that this isn't a really important group of people. Um, so we through our PLC, we you know we meet uh, week sorry weekly as a media specialist group. We really sort of dove into three different questions. How can we continue to establish and modernize our library media centers to be the center of each of their school buildings teaching and learning? Um, the notion of traditional libraries are quickly becoming a thing, of a, a thing of the past. How can we make the library that hubcap of the school that everything else radiates out from? Um, how can we ensure that within the library, the materials and resources that kids are interacting with are current, that they're relevant, and that they're representative of the school that they serve? Um, there's, there's a chance that even in one town, we have seven schools, we have seven, seven libraries, based on, the, based on the culture and dynamics of a school building, library collections may and may need to be a little bit different from one another. Um, they should be a reflection of the student body and we had some great conversations about how to make sure that that's the case. And then lastly, um, the library and media specialists are also in, in the seven buildings, our boots on the ground in terms of technology, skills, and knowledge. How can we make sure that you know, things that we're talking about are getting through to the, the teacher ranks? How can we make sure that we're being um, responsive to the needs of the building? Um, so we sort of developed each other in that also. We came up with two great outcomes this year. Um, one is the best practices for flexible scheduling in the LMC throughout the district. Flexible scheduling simply refers to that responsive nature of scheduling. Um, I guess the juxtaposition of that would be this fixed in place scheduling where you see the same group at the same time, um, you know, periodically. Flexible scheduling is this aspiration that you're going to guarantee to see every kid in the course of a week, in the course of a month, but you're gonna see them when they need to see you and when you need to see them. Um, so it really, um, it really stresses work in collaboration with teachers to make sure that um, you know, nobody's escaping the LMC and really making sure that the, libra that the library media specialists have their fingers on the pulse, you know, K through 12, the entire curricular continuum to make sure that they can support that with what they're doing with kids in the library. And then lastly, it had been a while, so we really took a, a, a close look at our library maintenance protocols, which means, you know, I mentioned keeping them current, keeping them relevant, relevant, and keeping them representative of the school communities that they serve. Library maintenance protocols, um, I can now say, are you know very clear and very consistent across all seven media specialists across the seven buildings, um, and we're having constant conversations um, about best practices in terms of. Um, weeding collections, ordering books, and just making sure that the resources that we're bringing into our library um, are completely representative of the communities that we serve. Um, so the second team that I work very closely with is our team of district-wide technicians. We started the year by co-developing four really crucial core values. Um, there is a tendency for people to you know, think about a team of technicians, especially when they work within the instructional technology department, um, as one-dimensional autom automatons. That is not the case at all. Um, we really wanted to put a priority on relationships with human beings, um, and that's a two-way street. So we developed these core values. Number one, be fast and be on time. Number two, be thorough and be accurate. Sorry about the typo. Number three, communicate <laughs> clearly and often. And number four, people are more important than machines. Through these core values, um, we meet as a team every Monday morning at 10 o'clock. The cornerstone of everything that we talk about, whether we're talking about you know, needs of a building, upcoming orders, we really are talking about teaching and learning. We're talking about teachers and students because that's who we serve and that's what's important to us. Um, the work of this team continues to be supporting all seven buildings each day. Um, we made a decision last year to start rotating the schedule so that every building could know every technician and every technician could know every building. That's worked out really, it continues to work out really well this year, um, even when adding a, a replacing a new technician for um, someone who had left the district. Because of these systems, he was able to pick up really seamlessly and become somebody um, who I think a lot of buildings have come to rely on. Um, we work on installations, we work on repairs, we work on troubleshooting, and most importantly, we work on customer service when we call we ask the question about what you need and we don't really ask many more questions than that. If somebody needs us, um, we try to provide the, the quickest, most thorough service imaginable. 
Um, additionally, on-site support of these bigger initiatives, whether they're awards assemblies, um, testing days, SATs, um, AP testing, just making sure that when uh, specific buildings, very specifically the high school, have these needs for anything that might stretch or test our network, that we're prepared for that um, and we're troubleshooting it ahead of time. Okay, how many do we have? Um, six. Six. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's sort of the, a lot of the work that we've done this year. I wanted to bring it to the board's attention because it's gonna be important considering the landscape that we have a couple of things that we're gonna be bumping up against, not only in this next school year, um, but in the next couple of years. Um, obviously, I, th I think a lot of you guys are aware that we had to make the really difficult decision to cut our instructional technology resource teacher position. Um, because of that and the work that that individual did for so many of our schools. We're gonna to have to figure out how to redistribute that work so that we're not missing a beat in the coming year. I wish I could tell you, like, this is our plan, it's gonna be seamless. We're really gonna to have to live it for a little while before we, we can even know where the holes are gonna be. Um, I mentioned earlier when talking about artificial intelligence that this landscape is not changing by the, by the year or by the month, it's changing by the minute. Um, if, you know, it, our work, and please be patient with our team and with our task force, is really making prudent decisions that are going to be lasting um, and beneficial for kids, not necessarily just jumping at the, at the first thing, but we really want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence if we're putting something um, in a teacher's or a student's hand. Um, in terms of marketing and branding, um, Jeff, you hit the nail on the head. What are the different ways that we can broadly and widely and consistently engage our community? Um, that happens to be a community for lack of a better way of thinking about it, that's already a wash in this digital communication. So are there different ways that we can get our message out um, to different corners of our community? And then lastly, just a, a budget mention, the rising costs of technology on balance are going up. I think subscriptions were up somewhere between, depending on the application, 10 to 15% just this year versus last year. Um, so also asking for a little bit of grace from the board when you see some, some different and funny looking numbers come your way through the budgeting process next year. Know that we're doing everything that we can to keep the cost down, but we don't, um, we don't ever want to put our kids in a, a, a disadvantageous position. Um, and sometimes that might mean cutting back on one thing versus another thing, but all of those decisions are, are not taken lightly and we're thinking about them um, sort of constantly. Hey, just on that last one, just curious if you've noticed a trend yet. I'm assuming those bumps won't be one-year bumps, but are you, are you anticipating more 10 and 15% increases, or, or do you think they come back to five, six? I would hope that they come back. I mean, I, I, I think this is a lot like the conversation about college tuition. I mean, at some point, it, it has to stop. Like it, it can yeah, only get so high. <laughs> so I, I only have the small one year sample size. Um, so I think I'd be able to answer that question yeah. a little bit better sure, next year. Sure. It's a, a fair question though. So how often do you go back and you evaluate what you've been using? How long has it been used? If it's still being used, you know, uh, can it be replaced? Very concretely twice a year at the end of the school year and also in the budgeting process, just to make sure that we're making prudent fiscal decisions. Um, but that, that monitoring teacher usage, student usage is a big part of the calculus. Great question. You're talking about hardware sharing? Mm -hmm. okay. And so, and, and, and the yeah, apps. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just as we talk about everything else is changing, so is yep. so are applications. Yep, 100%. Um, so, just making sure. um, so, just along the same lines, Sharon, we've got some upcoming financial considerations. Um, you, you know, I'm, I, in reviewing the budget, you probably noticed that fifth, we, we've got three grades of new Chromebooks coming in um, for the, the fall school year fifth, sixth, and ninth. We don't necessarily control this, unfortunately. Um, the Chromebooks all have a, a sunset date on them. And after that date, um, Google and a lot of times the hardware manufacturer can't guarantee that they're going to continue to get these critical updates. Um, we'll take as many back as we can, but we're only comfortable using them as in a loaner capacity. We can't give them to a kid who may be subject to not being able to get that critical update and have that kid not be able to rely on it. So the, the, we have a replacement plan through 2032. It just so happens that this year's um, three grades are up based on that sunset date of 2024. Um, what happens with those? 
that we pay that? Um, as often as possible, we try to put them back in circulation, just not to um, an individual student. So they go to schools, libraries, um, and they go to elementary classrooms okay. to use as learners. Um, so we're the, not donating any equipment to any outside organizations? Or not at this point. Not at this point. A lot of the ones that we can't use wouldn't be suitable for donation. Um, and students are allowed, when they receive their Chromebooks, because they're going to sunset as seniors, yep. they can take them take with them. them. Yes, yeah. yeah, seniors have a choice to either take their Chromebook with them or donate it back to the school, and we use it in the exact same capacity. Um, for What's the percentage of the keep them? I don't know yet because we just started the process, and I don't have the I don't have the numbers from last mm -hmm. year. I oh, bet I, I could find say, them. I thought we did it last year. Yeah, I bet I could find them, um, and I can get back to you. Um, and then lastly, for a couple of years, we've been making a concerted effort, um, and this is actually, a, a, the room is a great example. This is an interactive panel that we're watching on. We're um, trying to go as quickly but as responsibly as possible um, and put these in as many of our district classrooms as we can. Um, we anticipate having 40 to give out at the, um, between now and the beginning of the school year from three different funding sources, and they'll be installed throughout the district, hopefully over the summer, but also throughout the school year. We try to keep some of them in reserve when need crops up. We like to be able to replace a broken machine. Um, and once we get those 40 panels out, um, they will exist in 45, roughly 45% of our classrooms. So we're, we're making progress. Quick question on that, just yes. out of curiosity. The, the panels relative to the Latimer Lane project, mm -hmm. that number of 40 doesn't involve the panels that are in the FF&E &E nope. project over there, right? Nope. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. So, so it's, you'll it's make, outfitting Latimer yeah. You will and 45. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this doesn't have any impact on Latimer. Yeah. What makes these panels better than, like, is this just like, a, like, like a smart TV or smart board, like what is it? Um, I mean, it's like, it looks like it's hooked up with like an HDMI or whatever. It's got every, on. it's got all of the outputs, so it can connect to everything. It gives teachers more options. The picture and the sound are monumentally improved. So it's the it, the experience for the kid, and also it's connectivity to not only the internet but to. An so it's like a, it's like a Wi-Fi enabled. Yeah. It's, okay, so you can go right to Google. Yep. Okay. And the apps are built in. The, all of those Google apps are, among other apps, Khan Academy, um, some of the Pebble Go, some of the, the apps that they're using at the younger levels, mm -hmm. built right into the operating system. What so you, have, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what, what do you think of the lifetime of these things? Like, when will we, when will we start having a conversation about replacing them? <laughs> do I have to answer that? <laughs> um, somewhere between five and 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, ho I'm hoping for 10, yeah. but. There's yeah, a chance that it's five. It. Totally get it. <laughs> so my question was going to be about the app. So if the apps are there, is there an ability to save us in other ways? Was Not necessarily, because the apps are there because we're paying for them. Okay. So they're like these are subscription-based apps that okay. only exist on the boards because we're paying for them. Okay. Okay. So like we wouldn't necessarily get them for free. Did you try negotiating that? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Hey Dave, quick question. Yeah, just on math here, forty-five percent of our rooms is forty. Do we? That's like ninety total classrooms in the whole district. That feels low, unless I'm. Uh, sorry, the for the forty the infusion of the forty will bring the total percentage to forty-five percent. Great right. question. But cool. not including Latimer. Latimer no. is one hundred percent. Everything else is at forty-five percent. Yep. Okay. And then if you throw Latimer in, it will be up over 50. Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. absolutely. Okay. okay, so the goal is just trying to get a handle yep. for how those two yeah. things come mm -hmm. together. Cool. So thank you for asking. How can the Board of Education help? Um, and I think I just went through it in the last couple of slides. Um, I mentioned that we see it coming, but we don't necessarily have a concrete black and white plan yet for um, re replacing the, the, the work and the thinking from the technology resource teacher. So just you know, be open to, to two-way feedback um, on how we can do better, things that we, you may hear that we're missing or that are you know, falling through the cracks, although I hope that there are none. Um, understanding of the, the landscape of the instructional technology market at this point um, when we had that conversation. And then the first thing that I led off with 
is understanding our vision for this department is not as a standalone department, but about one that integrates with every other department and team throughout the district. Um, and we're trying to make decisions to impact other departments, not necessarily our own. Okay. And thank you guys so much for having me. I'll take any questions that you guys have. I have a few. Yeah, so you can go first. So, so on the AI side, um, do we have any parents involved? Not yet. In the committee? Not yet. I think that Are was you... that would be a goal for next year, and that's part of that engagement of the community. Okay. All right. Because I saw that, I was just not sure if you said you did include them or not. No, not yet. Okay. Um, I'll let him go, and I'll come back. Sure. Okay. Um, so you, um, first with the, the AI. So you kind of laid out some goals and I'll slip through the thing. So are there kind of any things like say in the fall we come back, any kind of like visible, actionable items? Like I saw like a AI 101 for the teachers mm -hmm. and things. Are there things we're gonna be able to see like with that task committee of like what's being delivered and or is it gonna be more integrated into the learning? I'm sure it'll be a little of both. I'm just curious what comes next. It's a great question. The last meeting that we had and, and when we sort of finalized that document, we're really in the mode right now of getting this to teachers not on the committee. So how do we take this broad? How do we, how do we integrate this, infuse this into our professional development plan? Um, my biggest goal for professional development next year, you know, from my department, is to um, begin to weave this into the fabric of our, of our curriculum. Um, so in terms of things that you can see, I think you're going to start to see a bump in usage in, in classrooms, um, a bump in communication from schools to families about things that they're trying. Um, but if, if you guys are, are around or catch wind of any of our um, professional learning days, this is gonna be a centerpiece of it. I think it's, I think it's great that, if I'm hearing this correctly, we're embracing AI as opposed to putting our hands up because as someone who's in IT, and I just came back from a Vegas convention, that was the number one talking point mm -hmm. you know, that was brought up, you know, among thousands and thousands of us. And, you know, six, seven years ago, it was a cloud, right? Before that was virtualization. But to, to embrace it in the educational world is, because if we don't, kids are going to be yeah. doing it and they are doing it well, they are. regardless. So we all know it. I mean, I have college kids and high school kids and they all know what it is. And they all, it's not just chat GBT. There's a lot more involved. So you're, you're bringing up the back of the school bus conversation. Yeah. Where do you want? Where do we want our kids learning about things? Correct. Do we want them learning in classrooms with trusted adults, or do we want them sort of figuring it out themselves? That that's never gone well for anybody. Yep. We think it's so important, and we also will not put kids in a situation to not be at an advantage, right? And they're gonna they're gonna. This is the competitive market, and we need to equip them with the skills. The really tricky thing is, you know, you, you talk about two different entry points to AI. You have the, the teachers who are gung-ho, and then you have the teachers who are like, not in my classroom. So that's kind of the balance that, we, you know, we have, to, we have to validate that perspective too. We have to understand where people are coming from, and we have to give them a door to walk through. It's low stakes at first, you know, baby steps to start. But if we believe that kids need these skills, then we have to have a way in for every single adult because it's not good enough to have this happening in a couple of classrooms and half the classrooms. This needs to be a guaranteed experience for kids. Think about it 25, 30 years ago with the internet, right? Yep. The same thing. It's the um, exact same thing. You know, oh, you gotta look it up in an encyclopedia. No, you don't. Smartphones too. Yeah. Like we go, we go in waves and you know, the, the when a wave comes, we always, awesome. it always feels very worrisome, but we're here about every 10 years. Like this is, this is something that happens. It just so happens that the next wave right now is generative AI. It's so I would end up, I was going to say, I, I'd end up saying, um, and if the teachers don't want to come along, um, I hate to say it, but shame on them because the kids are already there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was out to eat about a month ago and, you know, sometimes you just listen to the noise around you, right? And there were these kids sitting at the table and they were having this discussion. And the guy, the, the young guy said, um, well, I don't use it to write my paper, but I do use it to start my outline. You know, goal? so they're using it. <laughs> yep. Is the goal to integrate the ultimate outcome of this task force throughout each um, area, subject area, not just like history and English, nope. but across? Okay, great. The applications, and on the, um, so if you look at the first page that I gave you, the bottom of that first page, those are the five sort of buckets that we focused on. And I just have to look over yeah. your shoulder for a second. Um, so it really isn't just about student learning. Some of this is about teacher efficiency. Some of this is about um, supporting kids who need assistive technology. 
it there is a tool out there for everything and some and some of the tools are comprehensive but we really want so what we focused on this year was trying to identify one or two tools that we could endorse for each of these purposes <coughs> so it isn't about you know just english classrooms or just math classrooms it's about finding the right tools for the right situation if that makes sense mm -hmm. so the expectation would be and i think it's the right one personally across all schools right there's different levels of it but across the elementary schools kids would have the same experience for the most part no matter what right because it's coming from the district on this is our philosophy i would love to get to what you're yeah. saying but we're not quite at the expectations sure. point yet you know like i mentioned we want to make sure that we're we're bringing people along without you know calling them from the herd like yep. you know all of the viewpoints are exist for a reason we just want to make sure that we're acknowledging them all i would love to get to where you're you're saying what you're saying though yeah because i think ultimately kind of a little bit to sharon's point on right people coming along we ultimately this is still new it's fresh appreciate all you're doing right is that everyone's getting that same experience it's not like a cultural thing within each school or right group thing right that actually catches us is we're going to use it for this we're going to use it for that because you want it when they get to henry james mm -hmm. to all be kind of coming in from a similar place right? yeah you're talking about guaranteed experiences yeah. by grade level or that's the conversation we're having excellent did i understand you to say that the state said start looking into this but don't anything yet? They, I would sort of said that tongue in cheek. They issued a, a policy paper that, and when the state issues a policy paper, typically there is a policy that they're recommending. In this case, the policy that they were recommending was form a team, figure out your community needs, and do some research. So it was, it was kind of a non-policy mm -hmm. um, that gave us a lot of latitude to sort of um, get where we are right now. Is the chatter from the state that eventually they, they will come out with a policy mandate? Or is that there should be more flexibility with it, like the education standards and teacher evaluations, they've now gotten they, more power back? I, I have not, they tend not to do that. I don't see them driving yeah. hard on this. There's, no. a, there's a couple of states that have already gotten there, mm -hmm. and the policies that, a lot of the, a lot of the work that we based our conversation off of is from North Carolina's policy. They're one of three states North Carolina, Oregon, I think Carol, um, California was sort of in process. None of their policies are restrictive at all, and they're they're very much like consider this, consider that. They're more philosophical. Yes. Than mandated practice. Yep. Is that accurate? That's accurate. And that's the expectation we have for what's going to come down from Connecticut eventually. That it'll follow well, suit. I would think, right, but yeah. they haven't said. Yep. You know. It's, I would think so. Though. I think they're. I think on a on a more macro level, they're they're going through the same thoughts that we're going through, which is, it's it's hard to make something really prescriptive when a month from now it's it going to be, be different. It's going to be totally different. That's right. <laughs> so the best we can do is sort of align our philosophy and our vision with what we're hoping to do in classrooms. I mean, I, the only other. I mean, some of you guys have heard me say. I mean, even in colleges, this is becoming an issue, and it's changing so quickly, and so it's it's just really hard to kind of like you know, mm -hmm. lock it down yep. but because it is changing. But awareness is important. That's and, exactly where we are right And now. notification to the kids that we are aware is important. Yep. <laughs> you know, and plagiarism is still not acceptable. Right. No matter what you do, yep. you know. So Completely agree. Yeah. Just a general question. Um, first of all, I think this is fantastic. I think with everything you spoke about tonight, you seem very passionate about it, which is wonderful. Um, curious how you think we measure up from like an instructional technology standpoint to other districts or other schools that you've maybe researched or heard about or whatnot? Are we like ahead of the game? Are we on track or? We're definitely on track, if not ahead of the game. Um, obviously, I don't have any numbers to base that on. It's just yeah. the people I talk to, the different places that I've worked. Um, but I can tell you that as much as any other district, we make this a concerted part of the way that we do business. It's a consideration. And I, I think in that aspect, we are ahead of the game. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard to gauge it because it's not its own thing. It's, you know, it's evident in so many different places. The fact that we have this philosophy, though, that it is, you know, instructional technology is the thing that ties all of the departments together. I think that says a lot about what we believe in Simsbury. Cool. Great. Yes. If no one else has anything on AI, that is separate. Um, on the vision of the graduate videos, mm -hmm. great job, right? Excellent stuff. I'm just curious, kind of two part, maybe one for you, one for Neil. 
do you know kind of what you have in mind next for a video or at least some thoughts on it and then also for the comm subcommittee should we meet like in september or something i don't know when you put that in the books to kind of talk about kind of how's that going and some other things i know we've yeah. talked about doing i think early next year we're always looking for ideas <laughs> so i like before i commit to anything like maybe we run it through the Subcommittee. I think right. that and that great. would be the other thing that we talked about for the fall would be like an open house for the community for Latimer Lane. Yes, that's that it. we would want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. so, so I feel like I think those topics <coughs> would be yeah. right for September. Perfect. So I don't know when we schedule that or how, but <coughs> Katie and I'll figure it out this summer. We used right. to do an old school mailer. Is that has that gone by the wayside no, now? That, or that, that will be back. Right from AI yeah. to the old school. Yes. <laughs> no, so Go back to the old guy. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Let, let me add. No, it, I'm just thinking about, I'm sorry, just to think about how to communicate to different, different yeah. audiences. Yep, I like it. So that's all. That's all. So great point. <laughs> we'll be back to that in the fall. The challenge has been recent budget reductions mm -hmm. to the positions of the people that did those okay. things. We really need to come back and have conversations about the impacts we see mm -hmm. and prioritize. And it's one of the things yeah. the board talked about, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, for me even is like in our cycle, how do we do that? I think it's really important because one of the biggest challenges is we make the hard decision, right? We talked mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. and then we have ideas of who's going to do what, when do we come back and evaluate it? Because that's a classic example mm -hmm. that Katie and I were wrestling with. Oh my goodness. How do we pick this up late when that resource is, is yeah. no longer here. And we have a plan yeah. to do that now, but we actually missed the cycle of being able to produce it. No, great. Um, great. Because we made some changes last year, not this year, but last year. Excellent. And speaking of that, my final one was, I was just curious on the budget. So the rising costs, and we talked about, you know, it's hard to predict a percentage. And no specific, but I, is there anything just in general that concerns you the most as far as the way things are rising in cost, the things we're facing on budgets that would put us in a position where we have to start thinking ahead, because we've also talked about thinking ahead on the budget, yep. where these are these things are rising and these things are essential to keep up with the times, right? So it doesn't have to be an answer now, but I'd say it's one of those things, if as a board we're gonna try and do the budget stuff throughout the year, right. I would be curious on that because this tech stuff is just so important and it's rising yeah, and it's changing just kind of keep in mind maybe i don't know just like tier one tier two mm -hmm. tier three like these are the things we absolutely need there can be no compromise these are the things that would be really hard to deal without and, and these are the things that they're really nice and our kids get an advantage being here and having these but if they had to i think if we know that ahead instead of getting it at budget time mm -hmm. it would be helpful so a really good point i can uh, you know i can give you a half answer on the spot which sure. is hardware seems to be static, which is good. It seems to be the, the software and the online subscriptions that are skyrocketing. Yeah. But our, our prices for, you know, devices of all different kinds seem to be remaining pretty static. That's great. Are we able to work collaboratively with other districts to reduce the price? Get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like and like we do for other supplies and things like that? No, because, because of the companies that we're dealing with. Um, their licensing fees are where they get you and like some license by building some license by the student mm -hmm. um, but nobody at this point is going to cut you a, a communal break unfortunately mm -hmm. any other questions for Dave thank you thank you guys thanks for having me it. it's been great having you a part yeah, of the team this year welcome nice. yeah. yeah thank you Dave all right um, going on to the uh, Josh, this kind of speaks to your question, actually. <laughs> the yes. policy first, the first reading on the policy. Yeah, before I jump in, I want to point out through the interview process for Dave last summer, which was a very thorough process. Mm -hmm. At the very end, we had the question that said, imagine you're the successful candidate, mm -hmm. and one year from now, you're presenting <laughs> to the board of education <laughs> about your successes in the role. And thank you, Dave, you answered the question. Because um, that... We literally scripted that question, and uh, thanks. I really enjoyed, enjoyed the presentation. So this is quick. Uh, I hope that this is, um, we just passed all of our policies um, for this. This one is to 
kind of give us an ability to jump off in the fall. Recently at the workshop, um, Superintendent Curtis talked about the um, idea of forming a new standing committee of the Board of Education, which is, um, you know, to go with the policy committee, the personnel committee, the curriculum committee, and the communications committee, and this one would be a finance committee. So the language was sent to all of you um, that outline a few bullets about what the finance committee would do, recommend um, guidance for the superintendent of schools in advance of the development of a preliminary estimate, conduct a continuing review of financial practices, financial report formats and procedures, and to review revisions to the estimate of the cost of maintenance of the district schools. So those are some of the purposes of this committee that um, would meet to dig into the budget more regularly than just budget season. And we're presenting it to you tonight because of the three-pronged mm -hmm. approach to approving policy. If we start tonight and hit it in the fall, we can get the committee up and running right. in the fall. Perfect. So that's the that's the goal of presenting it tonight. This is great. We talked about this right at the retreat. I think it's a fabulous idea. I hope everybody else does too. As Neil said, it gives us a a, maybe a more continuous look at the budget so there are no surprises. So hopefully this is the first step to get at that. So any any questions or anything? No? Perfect. Great. As usual, if anybody has feedback because this is policy, you can let me know and we'll do a second reading at the first meeting of the fall. So, so with the reading and the this, like, so when could this realistically come? You said fall. Probably. Well, okay. right. Right. And even we can think strategically if we pull together over the summer at some point, which I think we plan to, right. we could slide a, yeah. a second reading into that meeting and we could hit the ground running at yeah. the first meeting with yeah. approval. Great. <coughs> so just one follow-up. Let's say we do that and it's approved that first meeting. Will everything be set up in place that it can start next day? Or will it then take some time to ramp up to get the committee into place? At a fall meeting, the chair will talk to everyone But for us to put together, Amy and I, a first yeah. platform of maybe, you know, just what fixed costs look like, what year end look like. I mean, I don't think it's difficult for us to pull together a good amount of information to get us thinking about, you know, baseline costs very early. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, the goal is yes, <laughs> to answer your yeah. question. Um, so, yeah. Uh, brings, any, well, any other questions? Great. Brings us to the second public audience. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, just with, with that said, uh, obviously our next meeting, our scheduled meeting, right, is September 12th or 10th, as we just mentioned, but as Matt and I both have mentioned, I, I'm pretty sure, pretty confident we'll be meeting and communicating over the summer. Um, I just want to take a second to, to thank each and every one of you. Um, my first year actually as chair, I appreciate everybody's help and support and, and patience. <laughs> and just thank you to the administration as well. Uh, you know, hopefully this has been great. I obviously appreciate every one of your support and assistance and guidance. Um, so just wanted to make sure I express my gratitude before we adjourn. So thank you. With, with that said, our, like I said, our next board meeting is September 10th and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Sure. Thank you. Second. All right. All those in favor. Any <laughs> One abstention. One abstention. No, I'm good. All right. <laughs>